Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Right. Well, good morning. Uh, ministry is messy is what I was going to say first off. And uh, man, it is messy from technology to people to uh, just, um, I, I was sitting here looking down on the uh, stage. There's some fishing line uh, and a paper clip left over from Ken Pitcher Live this last week. And so uh, a lot has happened this last week in our church with uh, almost 200 kids coming through our building and uh, praying to receive Christ and being ministered to. And uh, I'm just just telling you, it is sometimes the ministry is messy, and uh, I so appreciate Clay and Beth. They've been an encouragement, not only to me, but our whole staff, uh, all these guys up on stage uh, to encourage us, because uh, sometimes it is, uh, it's, it's a heavy burden. And, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at scripture, and we've been diving into some cultural issues that are very weighty. Uh, they're not issues that, you know, last week when we were talking about that very weighty issue and, and microphones going out and, and, and all the stuff that was going on in the, in the room at that time, that sometimes, man, it just wears you out. And this is not new by any means because if you go back in the New Testament and look at what Paul did with all the churches that he wrote letters to, and he wrote these letters to these different environments that he was addressing not only uh, theology of who Jesus was, but he was addressing on what was rising up in the middle of that church and and also how the culture was coming into the church and our response to that in a way that would bring glory and honor to God. And so this summer, we've been kind of doing that. We've been looking at some things that culture has kind of come into our church and how the church universal has responded to it. And, and, and the, the interesting thing is this summer, we've had some very interesting conversations. You have, many of you have told us your stories and, and they have been some of the deep deepest and weightiest stories that some of you guys have been through. And, and, and for others of us, we've struggled because some of these things we're talking about are highly emotional. There's an emotional attachment to a generation who viewed something one way to another generation that views it in another way. And that we've looked at what scripture has said to, about those. And some of us, that emotional attachment has been because we've seen the abuse of a freedom that has turned into a perversion, and you've been on the receiving end of that abuse, and I get it, because I've been there too. And so the last two weeks, we've actually moved in to probably one of the most heated things in our culture today, and that's sexuality. And for the last two weeks, we've been talking about sexuality. And somewhere along the way, the church decided that sex, you couldn't talk about it in church, right? When I was a youth pastor, this thing came along called True Love Waits. How many of you guys remember that, right? And here's what we communicated, not meaning to, we communicated that sex is nasty and terrible. So save it for the one you love the most and give it to them. <laughs> right? And the reason I know that is, is because now as I'm a pastor dealing with adults who went through that, their sexuality and their marriage is so jacked up and so messed up and sexless marriages and those things that go on in our day. You see, in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, Paul was dealing with a sexual perversion if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we introduced this as when Paul wrote them a letter about a man who was sleeping with his father's wife, and she, he wasn't dead. They kind of had this sex triangle going on in the church, and some of you still think the Bible's boring. You need to read it. Amen? And so Paul is writing them saying, guys, this has got to stop. In fact, Paul's greatest admonition to them is, is you are proud of sin, 
And so Paul begins to work through all of that in a sexual environment and culture. And at the end of the day, on both sides of the cross, we know that all sin leads to death. That Christ died for our sin. None is greater than the other uh, at the cross. And, and, And we have to love our neighbors out of obedience, regardless if they're believers or not. You see, we're to love all men as we love ourselves. Even those men who are in sexual sin, those women who are in sexual sin, believers or non-believers, he calls us to love them in the same way that God loved us. See, God postured himself towards us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to us when you were still perverted, amen? You weren't even breathing air, by the way, and God died for you and me because he loves us. And see, with forgiveness and love, Always comes obedience to Christ Jesus. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to read this again because I want to key in on one particular verse that we've not keyed in on. And here's what Paul says, beginning in verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that all that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But verse 11, look at it. He says, and that's who, what some of you were. But, big honking word, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He says, you were washed. You're not who you used to be, by the way. He says, you were sanctified. You were cleaned immediately before God. Why? Because we've been justified by what Jesus Christ did. You see, justification is an act of God. It has nothing to do with us has nothing to do with our behavior. It doesn't describe the way that God inwardly renews us or changes a person. No, it's a legal declaration that Paul was using that God pardons the sinner of sin, pardons you and I of sin, and accepts and accounts the sinner as righteous in his spirit. In other words, there's a big honking transaction taking place that changes who we are. That God declares the sinner righteous at the moment the sinner puts their trust in Jesus Christ. That at the moment we were saved, the moment we surrendered to Jesus Christ, at that moment a legal transaction took place that God took all the righteousness of Jesus and put it on us. And it changed everything. And it is solely based on the obedience and the death of Jesus Christ. You and I cannot be right in any way, shape, or form except by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's it. His perfect obedience and full satisfaction for sin is the only ground in which God declares us righteous. And in justification, God puts the righteousness of his son onto our account. Just as my sins were transferred to Jesus, at the moment that our sins were transferred to Jesus and he went to the cross and he died on the cross, at that same moment that you and I put our trust and surrender to Jesus Christ, at that same moment his righteousness was put upon us. So that when God looks at us, he goes, you are not who you were. See, we're not justified because of any good that we have done or we're doing or the plans we have to do good, right? Right? We're only justified through faith in Jesus Christ. That faith receives the righteousness of Jesus Christ offered in the gospel, the good news. Listen up, this is big. Because, see, if you've been saved, I love what Paul was just talking about a while ago. When you're in love, you can't hide it, can you? And when you've been saved and you've been justified, it changes your behavior. It's what the scripture calls sanctification. Sanctification. It's where we demonstrate the genuine article by producing good works. Our good works do not save us, but our good works are the evidence of what's happened in our journey, that's happened in our life. 
And both justification and sanctification are graces in the gospel. They always accompany each other. We cannot and would not and, and, and should not ever separate them because they go together. But yet, when we talk about them to understand that one is a legal thing of what God did to us through Jesus, the other is the process of where we've made holy before him, but there's a process of us working that out because we've been justified, because justification addresses the guilt of our sin. Where sanctification addresses the dominion and the corruption of sin in our lives. Justification is God's declaring us righteousness. Sanctification is God renewing and transforming the sinner. Us, our minds, our wills, our affections, our behaviors. That united to Jesus in his death and resurrection and indwelt and filled with his Holy Spirit. That we are dead to the reign of sin. In other words, here's what Paul said, you are not that anymore. In other words, quit acting that way. Do you know who you are? You see, our justification is a complete and finished act. Our justification means that every believer is completely, finally freed from sin. The only reason you're still in sin is because you want to be in sin. You see, our sanctification is that ongoing progressive work in our lives. And although every one of us who claim to know Jesus Christ is brought out once and for all from the bondage of sin, we're not immediately made perfect, are we? We will not be completely made perfect and freed from these bodies, this flesh, until Jesus returns and gives us a new body, skinny and long, flowing hair. Amen? Yeah. So as we said two weeks ago, a lot of us, all of us, live in what's called the now and the not yet. You see, in justification, our faith results in our being forgiven, accepted, and accounted righteous. And our sanctification, that same faith that actively and eagerly takes up all the commands of Christ given in the believer. You see, here's what some of us have done, is that we have bought into this idea of cheap grace. For some of us, we love the idea that we've been married right before God and that God sees us holy. But if we separate the fact that our sins have been forgiven and it doesn't affect the sinner who has been forgiven, then that is a cheap grace because that allows us to do anything we want to do because we've already been saved. Come on. That's why some of you in this room still justify your situations because you believe a cheap grace. And grace is not cheap. It was costly. It was a transaction that took place upon our account that involved the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf so that you and I could be made different and separate. So Paul was saying in this passage, that's who you were, and you're no longer the same. Therefore, we are obligated as believers, you ready for this, to put sin to death in the present members of our body and then to use our members of our bodies as a righteousness of Christ. In other words, our hands, our feet, our mouth, our eyes, our ears, everything that involves the instruments of our body should be instruments of righteousness and not evil. And for some of us, we have a cheap grace because we know we're saved inside. We just do whatever we want to do on the outside, and we justify it. So I think we all can agree, as we then move on to this week, that love does not include the approval of everything. Would you agree with that? Let me say that again. Love does not include the approval of everything. In fact, sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to disapprove, right? For example, if my daughter, who is going to be 15 this year, wants to go to a party, where I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there are going to be drugs and alcohol there, it would be foolish, immoral, and wrong for me to allow her to go knowing full well that's going on there, wouldn't it? And yet there's teenagers in the room that think their parents hate them because their parents are saying no, right? Amen? Come on. And yet some of us get mad at God because we just want to do what's right in our own eyes when God says no. Or God says this is not good for you. I think we can also agree that in this statement, is that God is love. Amen? And just as we set loving boundaries for our children, so God sets loving boundaries for us and holiness. And sometimes children wrongly believe that we don't like them or at the very least resent them. Sometimes we do the same towards God, don't we? And our culture is telling us that God doesn't love us. 
You see, God is the creator and the designer of life. It was his intention for us to be in relationship with him, that nothing would separate us from him. That was the beginning. That was, that was what God designed for us. And yet somewhere along the way, you and I wanted to do what's right in our own eyes, whatever we felt, whatever we justified. And that led to brokenness or sin. And, and so our indulgence or some of those things that Paul talked about or some of those things we're going to look at in Galatians today that, that Paul was really good at making lists, amen? And so if we look at that, and we're doing what's right in our, own eye, or in our own eyes, it all leads to brokenness. And God designed us to live in holiness. And he gave us instructions through the Lord Jesus Christ. That he says, I have your best interest in mind. I love you. And two weeks ago, I said that all sins are the same in the eyes of God. And that's true. And yet at the same time, we all know that God warned us that some sins have greater consequences and far-reaching changes in our life and our purity than others. While equal in God's eyes, all sin leads to death. All sin leads to brokenness. All sin separates us from God. But I believe we would all acknowledge that for you guys in this room to lie to your wife that you spent 50 bucks instead of 25 bucks on fishing gear is completely different than you cheating on her. Amen? Can we agree on that? Oh, that got quiet. Y'all were like, that was fun. That ain't funny. Because there's something moral, isn't it? And reasonable people can admit that it's worse for a parent to rape a child than for a parent to maybe spank him too hard. There's a different and moral level. See, Christ's universal coverage of sin through his death on the cross doesn't mean that all sins are equal in all respects, but only that all sins are equal in one, one respect. They're all covered. They're all covered. And you see, Paul is addressing sexual sin in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. And not to single out just the sexual sin because that's what we want to do. We want an order, don't we? If I can avoid this one and, and I can check off this box, Paul just kind of includes all the universal sins listed there. And he warned that the sexual sin has greater consequences than the other for it's the sin against the body. And we know that, don't we? We know that because some of you in this room carry the pain and the shame of that one night in college, that moment in high school, that trip you took, that business trip. We've heard story after story after story. And so we get that. You see, God created sex to be practiced between the opposite sexes, man and woman, within marriage, a covenant. I did a wedding last night, and in that wedding there in Waxahachie, I stood before that couple to tell them you are entering into a covenant, and God does not take covenant lightly. And a covenant involves sacrifice, and Jesus was the sacrifice and covenant for us. And so marriage was saved between a man and a woman, and it was God's idea for sex. Can I get an amen? Oh, come on, really? Amen. I'll say it. Amen. Let's do some jumping jacks. Amen. Let's get it. See, somewhere along the way, we taught that sex is nasty. Save it for the one you love. And it was God's idea. See how the enemy perverts our culture? And then the church begins to believe it and just trying to protect instead of just letting the scripture stand? Huh. See, God created it between a man and a woman. Simple biology would prove that it's between a man and a woman. Do I need to explain that to anybody? Yes or no? Okay? To go outside of God's design has incredible consequence. And here's what the culture is saying to us today, is that you can be born homosexual. Well, the question is, can you be born homosexual? Can this person say that? Yeah, a person can say just about anything, but that doesn't prove it to be true. So what does Scripture say about homosexuality? Because that's a big buzzword going on right now. And some of you may have mistakenly walked out of here last week saying, thinking that I said we have to accept that in the church. No, we accept everyone in this church, but we hate the sin that's killing them. Amen? So don't get me wrong in this. 
You see, you go back to the Old Testament, and everybody wants to go back to Leviticus. I think Jake did an outstanding job talking about Leviticus back in June. If you miss that, you need to go back and listen to it. But the Old Testament prohibits homosexuality, and this includes bisexuality. And you can go back to Leviticus 18, look, work through that, 18 and 20, and see that. And what's happened in our culture today is, and even people who want to bring this into the church, what they're saying is at these verses that they are from the old covenant and God made with Moses and the Jewish people. And since we as Christians live under the new covenant, old covenant passages are not binding. And it's true that a lot of the old covenant is not binding on Christians. But it would be a mistake to say that none of it is binding on us Christians. Because what primarily carries forward in the, in, the, in the Old Testament is not necessarily all the commands, but the moral commands carry forward. In fact, nine out of the ten commandments in the Old Testament are carried forward in the New Testament. And the ban against homosexuality is not just repeated in the New Testament, it's made even more clear. In both chapters 18 and 20 of Leviticus, it's clear that God not only finds homosexually sinful for Jews, but he went ahead and included it for all mankind. He included the Gentiles. That means everybody else. God was saying, guys, this is not within my design. I mean, simple biology will tell you that. Common objection in our world today says these passages are referring to abusive homosexuality. Well, now, Edward, what God was talking about in Moses' day, because in Moses' day, men were raping little boys. So that's really what he meant, not between two consenting adults. The problem with that is, is that both passages speak of adults. And to say otherwise is to read into the text or take it out of context in the text. There's simply no basis for that. Some would even argue that these passages only speak to male homosexuality, so all the ladies can do whatever they want to do. However, there's no biblical records of that either. Then you jump over to the New Testament, because I know some of you are going, yeah, but that's the Old Testament. So what's the New Testament say? Look at Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27. It's on the screen. It says, for this reason, Paul is building the whole idea of why Jesus came and Jesus died for our sins. And so he's calling out and showing us where our life was. For this reason, God gave them up to their dishonorable passions. What could be dishonorable passions? Their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their area. Error. Again. There are those that would say, well, now, Edward, really what Paul was addressing is homosexual activity between adults and children. And, and can I just say there's three major flaws with that? Okay, number one, the passage only refers to adults. Number two, it's not common for women to abuse girls. And number three, <laughs> homosexual partners were consumed with passion for one another. Listen to me, children are not consumed with passion for their abusers. Did you hear me? Children are not consumed with passion for their abusers. Romans 2, 4 states that God is kind and patient towards people to lead us to repentance. And let me give you a few more thoughts. You see, I would say that you're not born straight or gay, homosexual or heterosexual. According to biology, if we can just be honest, we're born male and female. Okay? Now follow me with me. There's no baby in this room that's ever been born homosexual or heterosexual. I was not born a heterosexual. I was born a male. <laughs> Therefore, a baby can breastfeed at his or her mother's breast and it not be sexual. Hello? <laughs> The baby was born male or female. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but what about those that are born with both? Thank God for science. Science is not pitted against Scripture. Because we live in a fallen world, yes, we know of situations like that because some of you are on the Internet and you scour the Internet looking for anything in the world. I don't know why are you, where you get all that time, but you do, and you scour the Internet. What about that baby born with both? Thank God for, for genetic testing. That we can now test DNA and know that that baby was born male or female. 
Now, can I just be honest with you? I don't have an answer for 50 years ago for some of those people. That's in the mystery of God that I don't understand. Can I be honest? But that does not change God's design. It does not change God's design. So I hold to the truth that God created us male and female. And I believe it's the responsibility of men and women to teach young men to be men and young women to be women and to teach them that God has created your desires for the opposite sex in a healthy way. It's not nasty. It's not bad. It's not going to kill you. And, and, and for us to teach them to move from being a baby to a boy or a girl, from a boy or a girl to a teenager to a teenager to a man or a woman, and we teach them what it means. And by the way, most kids don't even begin to notice the opposite sex until they're seven or eight years old. And little boys are still, ew. And little girls are like, ew. And, that, and all this stuff goes on. They don't, they're not born homosexual or heterosexual. So listen up. This is big. Because in all this mixed up culture that we have, when any person of any sexuality rejects God's design, or God's design for anything else for that matter. Listen to me, church. It is sin. And your sin separates you from God. And in the culture today, sexuality is broken. And yet Scripture speaks to it. You see, some of you in this room today, you weren't taught Maybe you didn't have a daddy or a mom, or maybe you had two dads or two moms, or a bad mom or a bad dad. Maybe you were raped, or your identity got messed up. And somewhere on the road, you don't remember when, it's just as far back as you can remember, you've always felt this way. And I think that's why a lot of people in our culture today say, I was born this way. Because somewhere along the way, brokenness, and we just gave in. We just did. And we don't remember when, we don't remember how. So I don't even argue that question anymore. When people come to me and say, I was born that way, I don't even argue anymore. Because, you see, sin will deceive you. Brokenness will deceive you. God designed us male and female, and he did that for our protection. And you see, for some of us, we've carried it over into our relationship with Jesus, our brokenness. And it may not be your sexuality or your indulgence. It might be simple as greed or anything else. And we know that some sin carries weightier sin than others. And you've just carried it on so long, and now it's affecting your journey, and you've turned the grace of Jesus Christ into a cheap grace that although I'm forgiven, I can still do what I want to do. And that is not grace at all. That is not grace at all. Because not only does it go against being a follower of Jesus Christ, it's just rebellion. It's rebellion that says my will is more important than God's. God, I, I know what you say about this, but I want to. Sounds like a seven-year-old, doesn't it? It's the opposite of what Jesus said. You remember in Luke chapter 22 when Jesus was facing the cross? He didn't want to go. God, is there any other way? Is there any other way? God, is there any other way? And in Luke chapter 22, he says, Not my will, but yours be done. He crucified his flesh. In the passage in the great commandment, Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your will. A heart that loves God shows it by obeying his commands, church. Many will claim to love God, but our actions show otherwise. And Jesus warned us in Matthew seven twenty one: not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, people of all sexualities have to struggle with putting God's will, whatever God's will is, above our own, above our flesh. And so I'll say it again. We are obligated as followers of Jesus Christ 
by his death and resurrection, listen to me, don't miss this, that we are to put to death and to present our members to God as instruments of righteousness. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Look what he says. Paul again is making a list, and it kind of goes along that same list. In Galatians 5, he says, but I say this, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. For the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, talking about the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, intimacy, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and in case I missed anything on your list, and things like these. In other words, Paul said, look at your whole life. And then he goes on. Look what he says. I lost my place. Here we go. And things like these. I warn you, as I've warned you before. In other words, he's warned them again. This isn't the first time they've been here. Okay? He warned the Corinthian church. He warns these churches that the people who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now look at the last verse here. Because this is, this is the key. Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ, in other words, you're not who you were. Those who belong to Christ have been what? What's that word? Say it with me. What's that word? Crucified the flesh with its what? And what? Oh. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There it is, isn't it? There it is. What does it mean to crucify the flesh? Paul's exhorted them to walk by the Spirit and not fulfill the desires of the old nature. In other words, you're not who you are, so start living out of who you are. And, and by the way, the only way you're going to do that, when Paul was writing to this church of Galatia, and there was many different churches that passed this letter around, the very first thing they would notice is, is that word crucified. And immediately in the, in, in the mind of the, of the New Testament church, they immediately went back to Jesus. What was Jesus? Crucified, Right? He crucifies the flesh. They're reminded of Jesus' death on the cross, but they also remember that time Jesus said, hey, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. So there's this whole idea that the cross was an instrument of death. So here's what Paul means by crucifying the flesh more than anything else. It's a radical repentance. It's a radical repentance that must take place within the life of the believer. Because if the radical repentance is not inside, you're going to keep doing whatever you want to outside. It's a radical repentance. John Stott says, turning our back on the old life of selfishness and sin, repudiating it finally and utterly. What makes crucifying the flesh so radical? What makes it so meaningful? First of all, Paul picked up on the merciless aspect of repentance. That crucifixion was certainly the way of the Roman world. And nobody came down from the cross because there was a group of Roman soldiers assigned to make sure no one came off the cross alive. Hello. No one did. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals. And Jesus took our sin and exchanged it for his righteousness. Here's the second thing, rejecting our old nature if you're going to get serious about crucifying the flesh, and I know some of you are going, yeah, but what about that homosexual stuff? No, 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 I'm talking to you now. If you're going to crucify the flesh, it is going to be painful. Do you hear me? It may not be physically painful, but it's going to be psychologically painful for some of you because you're going to go home and tell him to move out. You're going to go home and tell her to move out because you're not in covenant and you're in sin. Some of you are going to have to give up drinking and alcohol. And it's going to drive you crazy until you crucify the flesh. Put it on the cross and leave it there until it may die. And every time it tries to crawl off, nail it again. Finally, it's a decisive act. Criminals nailed to the cross did not survive. And neither can our old nature be tolerated or accepted. It must once and for all be dealt with. You see, Beth read that passage a while ago, and it wasn't in my notes, but I immediately grabbed it. 
in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if my people who are called by my name, by the way, that's what Paul said, you were called by the name of Jesus. This is just in the old covenant. But we can see in the new covenant how this could apply to us. Who are called by my name will humble themselves. And if they will pray and seek my name and, and look at that, listen to these last four words, stop their evil ways. You see, some of us are praying. Some of you are seeking but I'm just going to do what's right in my own eyes. That's why God's not coming back. That's why God's not speaking to you. That's why some of you can't get a word. Because you've not crucified the flesh. That we would decisively, and some with demonstration, crucify the flesh so that we may walk in the likeness of Christ. Now, some of you have been waiting for me to say that this whole summer. Finally, he's against it. I, listen, I'm against brokenness. I'm not against people. I'm against brokenness, man. And before some of you run out of here and lob your truth bomb at your nephew or your son or your daughter and, and going, you're a sinner and you need to die, man. Look at Galatians 6, because if we read on, Paul here was addressing a division in the church. He was addressing inside the, the church, and he also took the opportunity to address some of those things that were coming outside from the church. But he was talking about that division of that guy who led them astray. And in Galatians 6, we continue. Remember, they didn't have chapters when Paul wrote the letters. He didn't have verses. He just wrote them a letter, okay? So Paul didn't put chapter and verses when he wrote Woody K, these letters back in the Stone Age and Smoke Signal days. But he, he just wrote a letter, amen? And so if we keep reading, he says, Brothers... If anyone's caught in any transgression or sin, you can put sin there, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of what? Say it again. Say it one more time. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Listen, sometimes in order to bring healing to the sinner... We must have a compassionate view. And that involves our approach, how we posture towards those people. And listen, I almost took this out of my nose, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Moral failure in the church should not be a surprise. Nor should it be considered fatal. What's important is how we respond to it. And you see, the church has two ways to respond to it. Number one, the church can respond with harsh condemnation, which we have. I'm not saying we. I'm talking about church in general. Okay, so please, I love you, Summit. You are incredible. I'm talking about the church in general. And when we respond harshly, and maybe you're going to drill this down to your level where you're dealing with a nephew or a son or a niece or a brother or a workmate or somebody that has sin in their life, that response is going to crush them, and it will divide the relationship and the church. Or the church can respond in a spirit of gentleness, which brings restoration that not only honors the Father, but honors the one caught in sin. You see, the exact methods of restoration are not discussed by Paul because they're going to vary according to individual circumstances. That's why our response is not the same across the board. But Paul does specifically specify the manner, restore him gently, and gentleness doesn't mean weakness. It's one aspect of the, of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, that shows great strength under control. That when gentle Christians see someone caught in sin, they don't react in violence or with a truth bomb on Facebook. They respond in gentleness, devoting to love that person all the way to recovery. And only the Holy Spirit can empower us to do this. So let me give you some closing thoughts and we'll go home. Here's some practical suggestions. You can only restore if the person is a Christian. That's what Paul said back in 1 Corinthians, right? You cannot hold people accountable to live to a certain rule set or holiness that they have not committed to. So some of you that are holding the whole world of Facebook to the standard of Christ, it's no wonder nobody wants to be your friend. Amen? Okay? They need to be a believer. Number two, if the person is a Christian but isn't in relationship with us, you have not earned the right to speak into their lives. Okay, And this gets a little tricky in the age of social media, right? Because our constant interaction and distance acquaintances, we've now become friends with everyone. And so now, therefore, we feel like we have the platform to correct everybody. 
That's why some of you will post some of this idiotic stuff you put on there. And then you wonder why somebody blows up your post. Can I just give you a rule of thumb? If you go through your Facebook friends and you've not seen that person knee to knee, toe to toe, face to face, nose to nose, delete them. Because you have no right to speak into their life. Hello? Y'all didn't like that, did you? Oh, but they're my friend. No, they're not. They're your acquaintance at best. And if you hadn't seen them in 30 years when you graduated high school, delete it. Please don't speak into their life if they're claiming to be an atheist or homosexual. Don't. And you may say, well, what do we do, Edward? Pray, humble yourselves, put out evil in your own life, and then begin to live holy and invite people in that don't know Jesus to drink deeply from what you have. Amen? Let me say this and we'll go home, all right? Well, actually, we'll respond. Clay, y'all come on. Finally, we have to examine our desired outcome. What is your goal in approaching them in the first place? Amen? What's your goal? Is it health? Is it wholeness? Is it restoration? You see, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, if you go to the person and they respond, he says this, you have regained that one. The goal should always be, listen to me, the goal should always be, the goal should always be restoration, not alienation. Always. And by the way, you know that was God's goal for you. Have you forgotten that? you forget that that was God's goal for you when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you because we were broken and the most loving thing he ever did is to send Jesus he took our sin and put it on him and he died and those of us who will repent and believe he will take the righteousness of the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he'll put it on us and restore us redeem us give us newness and it's in this area right here where we crucify the flesh we crucify the flesh and I don't know what that means for you but I think you do some of you in this room know exactly what you need to put down who you need to ask out of your journey to crucify the flesh. And here's what happens when you begin to do that. There is a joy that begins to rise up over time. Doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't ha- Listen, you may crucify the something today, and you're going to struggle. Last Sunday when I left here, y'all know that four years ago I struggled like crazy with my identity. And last Sunday when I walked out of here, I felt like a failure. I felt like everything was done. I got on the lift and I rode the lift all through this building until 5.30 that afternoon, hanging all that KVL stuff. And the whole time beating myself up. You stink. You're a terrible pastor. All that stuff, the lies that the enemy had me believe in years ago. At the end of that day, we went to eat. And while I was eating, I thought, God, I don't want to do this all week. I don't want to do this all week. And God said, then I want you to fast. And for the next 24 hours... I'm going to restore you. See, some of you, those things you got rid of years ago, the enemy's going to come back. He's going to come back and try to get you again. Okay? And it's in those moments we humble ourselves, we pray, we fast. We love to feast, but let's also love to fast so that the Father can begin to minister to us. Amen? So let's respond. I'm going to invite our elders and our prayer team up across the front. We have stations of communion at the four corners in the back, and I would invite all believers, whether you're a member here or not, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that we want to invite you to take communion. If you need prayer this morning, maybe you've never moved from brokenness to life because you've never repented and believed in the name of Jesus Christ, then I would invite you to come grab one of these prayer warriors, these elders across the front, and say, I need Jesus today. Maybe you need prayer, whatever it is. I would just invite you to respond. Let's take communion. Let's stand together. If you need prayer, you come. Let's do communion together. In just a moment, Clay and Beth will close us out. Come on, let's stand. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.